Welcome to the Berkshires Gone By, history and folklore about the westernmost and most beautiful county in Massachusetts. I'm your host, Brooke. The Red Lion Inn stands in a place of prominence at the corner of South Street and Main Street in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, and has been in that spot since its construction as an inn in 1773. Though when first opened, it was called the Stockbridge House and was owned by Silas Papoon. Since its inception, the symbol on the sign of the inn has remained mostly the same, that of a red lion. In the beginning, though, the lion's tail was green. The color difference might have been to represent red for the British crown, still in power when the inn was built, but green for America's desire for independence. Just a year after opening, Silas opened a tavern in the building as well, and representatives from the other towns in the county gathered at this tavern to talk about shrugging off English power and decided to boycott English goods. The inn became a regular meeting place for those wishing to talk about the latest news of all sorts, especially during the era of Shays' Rebellion. The Stockbridge House was expanded 74 years later by the addition of many more guest rooms, but these weren't used in the winter when the inn would shut down for the off-season. In 1842, the railroad came to town, and the influx of tourists was a boon to the inn. In 1862, Mr. Charles Plum and his wife, Mrs. Mary Ann Plum, her maiden name being Heaton, and she also went by the nicknames Mert and Mercy, bought the inn. One of the first things they did was change the sign. The line was still red, but its tail became red too, as the revolution became a distant memory. And the new owners thought the red looked better. The lion was also given a shield to rest its paw upon. At times, the shield bore images, such as a stove, a skeleton key, a clock, a high boy, a teapot, and the name of the inn was changed to Plum's Hotel. It was Mrs. Plum's love of everything old that inspired the images of antiques on the sign, often affectionately called Aunt Mert. She was described as a warm-hearted woman with a great sense of humor. It said that she had an agreement with traveling merchants. If they brought her an old teapot, she'd pay them 50 cents, and for a mirror, a dollar. This brought antiques right to her door. Not to mention that whenever she went for a leisurely carriage ride, she'd stop by the older homes in the area and ask if they had anything of age that they'd be willing to part with. She somehow managed to buy a mahogany table that Abraham Lincoln had eaten at, and Charles Dickens. In 1884, a third story was added to the inn, and it could now accommodate a hundred guests. And in 1891, the name of the majestic establishment was changed to Ye Red Lion Inn, which, despite its former name, people had often called it anyway, due to its memorable mascot, the Red Lion. The shield on the Red Lion sign was later changed again to show the date 1773 and 1897, the year it first became an inn and the year it was reconstructed after being destroyed. But wait a second, we'll get to that. People were offered every comfort, including two bathrooms. For such a large number of rooms, this may seem silly, but there was a slight problem. People of the day wanted the convenience of a bathroom, but not to have the room next to one. As it was thought, bathrooms would spread disease. So the rooms by the bathrooms were harder to let. People also didn't bathe in bathrooms. In fact, if one could afford it, they'd travel with a bathtub a large tin basin, either oval and deep, or round with a seat on the lip. And when the stage came, or later on, the train would arrive, it was just as common to see a bathtub being carried up to a newly rented room as it was to see baggage. If one didn't have enough money to travel with a bathtub, a simple cloth and pitcher of water had to serve as cleansing tools. The Red Lion Inn had a ballroom, which became a common place for people to gather and dance. Countless couples met 
and courted upon that dance floor. It also became the starting point for all the otherworldly Ice Glen parades. Large groups of people all done up in costumes would walk by torchlight into Ice Glen, where they'd wait by great bonfires for all to get there, then set off again in amongst the mysterious rock formations, the shadows thrown by the torches, the women's delicate and ill-suited shoes, which made the rock scrambling sometimes humorous, and elf-like costumes, made for a thrilling and memorable night. Later on, in 1893, the management of the Red Line was passed down to their nephew, Alan T. Treadway, but he had bigger plans, and ran for, and was elected to, Congress. But before he could, the Red Lion Inn suffered a huge setback, its destruction by fire, in 1896. Story has it that Heaton Treadway, a man who would later be the landlord of the inn, but was a baby at the time and son of the future congressman, was plopped in an open trunk in the roadway as his parents ran in and out of the burning establishment trying to save Aunt Mert's massive antique collection. It's also said that as they fought the blaze, firemen could see the baby giggling and clapping, entirely entertained by the flames. The fire destroyed the entire building. It was too fierce and the firefighters too underpowered to be saved. However, most of Aunt Mert's antique collection was rescued. Amazing, considering the enormous number of pieces. One short year later, and the entire building was completely rebuilt, and in almost the same style as the first, save a few small variants. And additions, such as a luxurious Otis elevator. When first installed, this elevator ran on traction, but it was later converted to hydraulics, and each room was fitted with a Franklin stove for heat. Oh, but wait, the fires weren't over. The roof burned in 1908 and was replaced with slate. The rocking chairs on the inn's lovely long front porch were hardly ever without a happy visitor. And in 1916, after the death of his uncle Charles Plum, Congressman Alan Treadway was given ownership of the Red Lion Inn. In 1934, the tavern was finally a tavern again with the end of Prohibition. After a little refurbishment, the lion's den opened to serve fine brews. It was actually meant as a surprise. From Heaton, his first name being the maiden name of both his mother and his Aunt Mert, to his father, Alan Treadway. In 1947, Alan Treadway died, and his son, the little laughing baby who witnessed the Great Fire, inherited ownership of the Grand Hotel. But only eight short years later, he and the rest of his family decided to move on and sold the establishment to Burn Bower. And for the first time, the Red Lion Inn was open for the entire year round, but it soon reverted back to seasonal only. But this new method of operation didn't mean that the inn stayed in his hands for very long, and it was soon given back to the Treadways. Robert Wheeler bought it a year later. New attractions were added, air conditioning, and a heated pool, as well as a more modern, motel-like addition that might be more appealing to the modern traveler who sought out simpler, stylish accommodation, perhaps without so much historic charm. Despite these upgrades, for a brief moment, it was thought that the inn was at risk of being sold again and torn down to make way for a gas station. However, it was rescued when it was sold, one more time, to the Fitzpatricks, Stockbridge locals, who also owned Country Curtains. They consolidated the locations by moving the Country Curtain store into the Red Lion Inn. It wasn't until 1969 that the Red Lion Inn opened for year-round operation for good, and the Red Lion Inn added to its dining offerings. There was still the Lion's Den, which offered drinks, pub fare, and live music. Then there was also Widow Bingham's Tavern on the first floor, which offered another venue for drinks and food. 
there's the courtyard outside that offers seating during the warm months, though those are extended as the patio has a radiant heated floor. And of course, there's the grand dining room for white tablecloth service. Now the hotel takes yearly part in the reenactment of the famous Norman Rockwell painting depicting Stockbridge Main Street decorated for Christmas, an event that attracts countless people to the beautiful little town. But each season seems to bring some sort of lovely decor. Even giant pumpkins have sat beside the grand red lion statues that flank the little walkway out front. There's also a quaint gift shop in the front corner of the hotel that offers delightful mementos and local art. And of course, there's Simon, the Red Lion Inn's resident cat. He's even got his own children's book. Another resident, a resident that's been there for quite some time, is apparently a ghost. It's said to have been seen now and then in room 301, but has also been witnessed in room 312. He's described as a gentle appearing man, made as a sort of vapor or mist and that if you do get a good look at him, he's liable to fade away quite quickly. People have reported being startled by him, but have never really described him as frightening. He seems quite friendly, and is almost always said as being clad in a top hat and antique attire. So if you've been longing to snuggle into a comfortable chair by a fireplace, or roam beautiful rooms and long halls, adorned with hundreds of antiques, why not stop in at the Red Lion Inn, one of the last surviving Grand Berkshire hotels? This has been The Berkshires Gone By, created, written, directed, and read by myself, Brooke Renier, and co-produced by Deanna Garner. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, where you'll see pictures pertaining to Berkshire history. You can also find more episodes on Facebook, on YouTube, or by visiting our website, www.theberkshiresgoneby.com where you'll find many more images pertaining to each specific episode. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. Thanks for listening. <laughs>